This is tape recording number 5008C30 of the Oakland Public Lecture Series. A tape recorded lecture given by L. Ron Hubbard on the 30th of August, 1950. The title of this lecture is Preventive Dianetics. It is 73 minutes long. Copyright C, 1950-1974 by L. Ron Hubbard. All world performance rights reserved. This recording has been re-recorded by the Flag Audio Unit of the Flagship Apollo of the Sea Organization. And now, here is L. Ron Hubbard. Well, it's time to tell you while people are waking up, getting there, and so forth. I'm absolutely fascinated to read something by Lois G. Lobb, M.D. It says, Dear Doctor, what about this Dianetics that is a bestseller? And he says, Every thinking Catholic knows the dangers of self-will. I wonder if this person is trying to really work with the Catholic Church, or isn't he? Because... And whether or not uh, these guys who know nothing about Dianetics can keep going on and on this way without being visited by one of our goon squad. It says, Dianetics is just another bad smell from the rotten body of our secular world. <laughs> Boy, I can sure tell you her, Ingram. <laughs> it says, what do we mean by being well-adjusted? But Joe Stalin is well-adjusted to Russia. The devil is, no doubt, well-adjusted to hell. The well-adjusted now do not believe in words like discipline and sacrifice. They read a salt to disinhibit themselves, or a Howard to get rid of their prenatal engram. A Howard. Yeah. <laughs> Why this person really knows he's Dianetics? <laughs> the keenest minds in science, not yours, lady, are now groping for God. Poor God. <laughs> the foolish followers still worship yesterday's dead sacred cow. Many psychiatrists and pseudo-psychiatrists think their job is to help people go along with the crowd. That way lies death. In the first place, there is nothing that raises quite as much hell with being well-adjusted as Dianetics. Well, this morning, happily enough, we're going to talk about preventive Dianetics. Let us hope that someday, far distant future, or maybe not so far distant, that we can prevent the Lewis G. Lobs. <laughs> Actually, the person is probably in very bad shape, and uh, should be pitied there far, although I don't think we'll bow our heads in prayer. Well, I'll bring you up to date on a couple of uh, little notes came in from Elizabeth. You can do what you will with this, but uh, there's a possibility that one of the many mechanisms of schizophrenia may be contained in the phrase, I'm all alone. That is the whole series of phrases which mean I'm all alone. I have to be by myself. I have to get away by myself, think it out, and so on and so on. I am all alone is uh, possibly a very responsible phrase for this. We are looking for the central phrase in various cases. And this search is uh, an interesting one. For instance, the paranoiac seems to inevitably surrender to a ghastly fascination. Two little words, not three. <coughs> the two little words are sufficient to cause a very serious, I'll boom it up a little bit, but it caused such a serious thing as paranoia to think that uh, this set of phrases could lay in ruins a continent seems, uh, well, you wouldn't think that no motto certainly ever succeeded to that extent, but we think of, for instance, the last few years we had a fellow named Hitler. I don't know what the German equivalent of they're all against me is, but I'm sure there is one. So uh, here's uh, that little trick that, that may be, of course, Schizophrenia is caused by a superabundance, evidently, of control circuitry. And uh, it is very hard to reach the person quite often, and it may be on a further research that this is one of the center phrases for this type of case. Now, a repeater phrase that should be used as just the routine should be, I love you. Use it as a repeater phrase. You may find yourself winding up in a very uh, nice 
sympathy than gram or something of the sort, and perhaps get a grief with charge on it or something. We want to talk this morning about a subject which probably in the long run is even more important than the general subject of processing. And that is fixing people up so they don't have to be processed. And the way to fix them up is catch them at conception and keep them engramless from there on out. It's a very simple formula. Around a woman who is injured, who has been jolted, shocked, or who is, has just received news causing her great grief, say nothing. That's around a woman, unless obviously she is either too old or too young to be pregnant. To be safe, that's it. Around any person who has been injured or who is anathem, say nothing. Not even Around anyone, in short, who has a case of analytical attenuation, be quiet. The second stage of it is to prevent the key in of engraft by keeping things very calm around this person, around any person, by not quarreling, for instance, the vicinity of a child. If no disasters are striking in the vicinity of a child, he may have a large bank full of engrams and never for a moment suffer the consequences of any one of them. This is an almost impossible goal, but it's one which should be sought. In addition to that, in preventive Dianetics, one should give attention to the pulling of tension units up to present time on a necessity level. One should create, perhaps, an artificial necessity level, place one athletically in danger of his life, something to say. One doesn't pull up necessity units at the present time by suddenly giving a person a piece of bad news. One pulls him up to present time by, uh, oh, I don't know, dropping him off a yard arm, 75 feet down into the sea. That's one method. You know, people whose whole life flashes by when they're drowning, they're coming up to present time. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> Hardly anyone is not better off for having been drowned. <laughs> Providing he lives through it and providing it itself is not an engram. Because <laughs> you lay down these specifications, it immediately becomes impossible. <laughs> well, these are the central pivots of preventive Dianetics. The distance these things carry is very wide. The application of preventive Dianetics reaches into every branch of society. I know of no part of man's activities that could escape this because we're working with the basic mechanism here. We are keeping him from getting inside him the cause of insanity. We could take a person who had no engrams. We could give him a youth wherein practically every day contains a parental quarrel. Nothing's going to happen to this person. We could uh, give him, fix it up so that every teacher he had disliked him heartily. Nothing would happen to him. He'd get some odd educational data about the world, but he would calculate how to get around it. And man being what man is, of course, it would be impossible for everybody to dislike this person. Since probably he would be a rather likable person, but not for that reason. One could give him Freudian toilet training. And nothing would happen. And it and one could, uh, he could lose both parents under very bad and horrible circumstances at the age of six. That's some sort of an idea. We know how it works the other way, but when we take a look at it, the same mechanism in action, we realize how things are. In the absence of the engram, it makes an entirely different picture. We're so used to an aberrated society where everyone in it has engrams that we look at the reactivation, re-stimulation of engrams as the normal average procedure. 
And we look at the manifestations of engrams and we consider those to be man's natural course. It has become part of our educational strata that naturally if you do so and so to a person, you get such and such results. Well, actually, such a generality is impossible. You'll find out in dealing with aberries, if you do such and so to A and do the same such and so to B, you're going to get two pretty widely different reactions. But uh, we have sort of agreed upon, having read the novelist on the subject, that uh, humanity reacts in a certain way. Now, that is an educational pattern. It doesn't happen to be in frankly any part of it, true. He's educated into the belief that the second that someone comes in and says, your mother is dead, the person says, boo-hoo, I love my mother very much, and thereafter goes into a sharp decline. So, one could feel very sad about mother being dead, feel very uh, sad about the thing, and uh, after the funeral, why, be in excellent shape, because Painful emotion engram depends upon the physical pain engram for its action. You can't form an engram if there's no basic engram on which this should append. The general breakages of affinity, for instance, are almost would be almost impossible. The breaking down of a person's sense of reality, if you, if you had this person with no engrams and he was told rather consistently by somebody, well, you're wrong, you know, you're not right. You're just you just don't know about these things, which person merely, instead of breaking affinity, communication, and reducing his reality, we would tell him, oh, all you do is imagine everything else, even if they're a little kid. Why, uh, the end product of this would be child, if it were a child, would have the idea that his parent was not quite right. <laughs> In other words, it would be an analytical adjudication. One would get the reasonable response on such a thing. Furthermore, the number of illnesses would decrease markedly. We'll go into that tomorrow. But the prevention of the engram would give us a brand new society, just all by itself. No therapy, no education, just a mechanical process. Everybody agrees to keep his mouth shut around a person who has been injured who is ill or has any analytical attenuation. Just on that agreement in the society, if it carried along within uh, a matter of about 35, 40 years, we'd have an entirely different society. It would have come up a steep curve. We're dealing in Dianetics with an inevitable thing. It's as inevitable as uh, politicians. Here we are dealing, I say, not to belabor the point, doesn't need much belaboring, just bringing to your attention that if by some means or other the society, not knowing anything about Dianetics, not knowing anything about techniques of application, nothing, would just agree that it was very, very bad mores. It was worse than killing a man without knowing what it was doing to him or anything. It would be worse than uh, voting socialists to say something around a person who was unconscious, or around, or to quarrel, or otherwise disturb a woman who might be or who was pregnant, within the course of a generation, you would see a marked change in the whole society. Marked, yeah, marked from about here to about there. So, it's interesting that uh, people who have had great confidence in a sort of an automatic working out of man, of his mores, it's interesting that uh, he never hit upon this as being immoral. Well, he never knew it was immoral. Uh, of course, things that are immoral are things which uh, injure, actually. So he didn't know about this, and it was never considered immoral. But it's an odd thing that by accident somebody didn't uncover this one. Man's history demonstrates that he has stumbled onto all manner of mechanisms by accident. He knew not anything about the cause of it, but he knew a little bit about the effect. And uh, he got this idea and he carried forward. But it was a matter of visible evidence. 
in each one of these cases was a matter of visible injury, and the engram is an invisible thing. So, we are being too hard on man because, actually, what has man done now? He's all of a sudden uncovered it. So, uh, let's overlook that point. Now, it will probably enter into the moral structure here in the next few years. Tell your grandmother, rob banks, do anything, but for God's sakes, keep your mouth shut around an unconscious person. I uh, know that uh, that's coming. There'll be a period there at first where people will have the tendency to say, shh, don't talk. <laughs> I know already that there is antagonism toward this idea in some quarters. People who are badly aberrated are suddenly becoming aware of this fact. They don't seem to resist finding an unconscious person so they can open their big yap. The indoctrination of people into this principle is uh, very difficult until suddenly they know about it. I should have brought a letter from a medical doctor who was using this. He says he's having an awful hard time educating other doctors with whom he is working into being quiet around his patients when they are ill or injured and so on. Now, in preventive dianetics, we get several conditions. A person, for instance, just recovering from an operation is in a very perilous and serious state, is apparently conscious, apparently able to speak, and is at best, usually, in amnesia trance, will come up out of amnesia trance into actual life trance. Here's pain and everything else. Now, to give you an example of this, there was a lady in a hospital who had delivered a child, that is, the child had been born, the lady was hemorrhaging rather badly, and uh, she continued to hemorrhage for several days lightly and then heavily again and lightly, and people were getting very interested in her life because uh, one can't keep this up forever. I gave her a few quick questions on this order. When did you see immediately after delivery? Nobody. When did this bleeding start? About uh, two hours after delivery. When did you see immediately after the bleeding started? Nobody. Nobody. Oh, yes. Yes. The nurse came in and said, said something, said something, I'm, I'm not sure what. And uh, then she said, said, I'll roll you down now. You know, one of these beds and they'd left her propped up, feet, head. I'll roll you down now. Now just lie there quietly. I clipped back on the line, ran that thing out, brought her up to present time, took her out of that tail end of the incident, and the hemorrhaging stopped. Of course, this looks like straight magic to an MD who doesn't know Dianetic. You know how easy it is to do something like that. You've got the mechanism. Here is an instance of a nurse placing a human being in danger of her life. Actually, it's not a light thing. It is serious as hell. Here's a little kid just born, getting along fine. Here's a husband who needs his wife. Here's a woman who is certainly entitled to her own wife. And some damn fool rushes in and says, I roll you down now, now lie there quietly. Right after an operation, all could have been prevented completely. Now, just those little words, why it doesn't mean much, does it? And this person, I wish you could have seen this one. He was anemic to up the point of being waxy. You know, and anemia really sets in. So preventing Dianetics is very, very interesting. It goes out in some other lines. Let's take the line of industry. Let us take a person who has worked for several years in the same area. Naturally, every time he has been injured in that area, or every time he has been slightly anatent or re-stimulated in that area, he has received all the environmental perceptives. That is to say, let's take a fellow, uh, take, make it something dramatic and say a steel plant and uh, there's the roar of uh, the furnaces and so on and he's got the odor 
around there. There's such and so, and the feel of the floor, and all that. And uh, he hits his head one day, just that, see? He hits his head, and somebody immediately says, uh, come over here. I mean, we just get that consecutively. Well, that maybe that was the first time it happened. The possibility of keying something in at that moment is great, but we key it in with the additional bundle of all the environment of where this person works. That's we're working in a steel plant. Men get killed in steel plants. You don't have, have to make very many mistakes along this line to kill somebody. But here we have a person, hits his head, somebody says something. He burns his hand, somebody says something. Lord knows what it would be. Uh, just anything. They could be holders, bouncers, deniers, anything like that in the reactive mind. One by one by one, up the line, we finally get to a point where one day he comes down. By this time, some attention units are held in several places on the track, and uh, he isn't feeling too well this morning. He's got an engram and a restimulation, and the restimulation of the environment, of course, is what's very responsible here. And uh, he throws the wrong lever, and two men die who have. No connection with him whatsoever. I mean, two men leading different lives, they just happen to work in the same place. Industrial accident. Now, preventive Dianetics can then be said to go forward into the prevention of this type of accident. George Jones is driving down the road. He has an engram which makes him get exorbitantly drunk. The unclean engram says, I can't see. It says, I can't see straight. It says, you don't know what you're doing. It said, uh, well, more yakety yak. And he's driving down the road. He's drunk. This engram goes into restimulation by some perceptive. All of a sudden, three across the road into another car. Three or four people die in the other car. What did they have to do with this engram? Preventing dying is also the heart and soul of accident prevention on the highway. It is an old, old saw with the traffic departments that 10% of the drivers cause 90% of the accidents. I'll go further and say that all the way up and down the line, that 100% of the accidents are caused by engramic restimulation. If it's a mechanical failure, it means somebody failed in design for some reason or other, but his ability must have been inhibited a bit for him to have failed so signally and design a design into which he was thoroughly educated. A mechanic might have had a headache that morning who, when he was fixing the steering apparatus and didn't quite seize down the bolts. And the highway department might have been just a little bit careless about all this, a couple of engrams on the subject, well, it doesn't matter anyway, maybe, in the part of some workman, and uh, the sign that should have been there isn't there. And here you and I are driving down the highway, the next thing you know, we're injured in a hospital, something, not through any fault of our own, because somebody got an engram into restimulation. When one looks this over, he finds then that if this is not a personal project. It's not a personal project. It isn't a whim on your part or my part that all of a sudden we de this society. It isn't just an idea that we get suddenly and decide to go on a big crusade for, and uh, he's silly, he believes in this. We're dealing with the very stuff of which hospitals, morgues, and cemeteries are made. It is a very great problem. As one goes back down the line, looks over accident reports, he finds occasionally this gentleman, the accident prone. Ah, yes. Very strange fellow, the accident prone. Some of the data assigned to accident prone, it's not fairly checked, seems to demonstrate that there's a sort of a telepathic thing about accidents, just as there's a sort of a telepathic thing about mass hysteria. On a further, very cursory investigation, it would seem that a 
An engram is the best broadcaster in the field of telepathy of which I know. All the evidence I have with telepathy, which is really very good evidence in some places, announces that this was an engram which is broadcasting. In other words, the reactive mind and the animal body, you might say, long since developed an alarm system for the herd. And having developed this alarm system for the herd, in that bracket, it now functions best in that bracket. You will find, for instance, two people in an argument who have never seen each other before, and this person will say, yaggity, yaggity, yag, and the other person will come through with the other half of the engram, the other valence. <laughs> this affinity, communication reality proposition, is very interesting. We said affinity was a reverse charge and became grief. When affinity was a reverse charge, it became grief. That as one approached grief, fear, terror, and so forth set in. In other words, we had a tone scale operating, and we could draw affinity up to its tone scale all the way up, and we could get a spectrum, the spectrum which starts with the cohesive force, then on being reversed, seems to become, it doesn't become a destructive force so much as it becomes a, uh, it has, what I'm trying to say is it has its own characteristic all the way through. It starts at the top, love, cohesiveness, and so forth, and down towards the bottom of the scale, where we have, would have a herd, for instance, which would have to be alerted for some danger, we would, for instance, get a fear, shock reaction, which would broadcast and cohese the herd into flight. I don't think this isn't important in preventive Dianetics. The amount of mass hysteria has been vastly underestimated. Did you ever walk into a room where people have been quarreling? Now you think perhaps, rationally, that uh, it might be just because you don't like to see these people coming with it. But there's an actual sort of impact involved in it. I don't know what it is unless it is this form of alarm telepathy. When one is living in a society which is full of these engrams, he can, of course, be expected to act with the of these principles follow, which they may not. But these principles would follow that you could expect on this telepathic line a very definite reaction in the society itself. Now, your accident prone could be explained along in these lines, but he also includes the person who purely by mechanical means kills, injures other people. And then Graham and stimulation in uh, one chap caused him to practically cut his hand off. It went into stimulation, it had been picked up, it hadn't been reduced. And for about three days, he went into this situation of Going around, he had three accidents with that hand. As a matter of fact, at this moment, he's carrying a scar. A piece of bad auditing through an engram, which says uh, something to the effect that he, he uh, had to cut his hand. said, which hand, too? And he managed to do things with that hand, which injured it. And the last one he did was to actually take the whole area off here. That is what an engram will dictate, and a person will follow it. Furthermore, if you have noticed, there is an actual fact that in the vicinity of an accident, other accidents happen. Some foolish traffic department someplace started the practice of putting up crosses wherever a highway death had occurred. And all of a sudden, the crosses were just piled right up there in that one spot. One after the other. More, 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 more. They did away with the crosses quick. Now here's the suggestion that there is death. Anybody coming by with one of these things to trigger says, Yeah, here's my chance. Scream. <laughs> 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 That's one level. If you've noticed, too, that the observance of a sudden accident will cause several mistakes to be made immediately afterwards. Other people in the vicinity of the accident will make mistakes. This could be on a alarm reaction level as well as a mechanical level. 
I'm not trying to include the alarm reaction telepathy here. It is not a necessary postulate to any part of preventive Dianetics. Now, I'm just telling you about it in passing. Something, ever hear of the mathematician's two-dimensional worm? Well, they keep talking mathematics about this two-dimensional worm. Uh, we could look at the two-dimensional worm this way. He's busily crawling along on a two-dimensional plane, and one day he bumps into a post. And uh, he walks on and he says, no, that would have to, there's no post there, that's all. It couldn't be. And uh, he comes by another day and he shoulders it again. And he's aware of the existence of something, but of course he would be unable to think in the third dimension. Now, uh, we're in that spot where alarm reaction telepathy is concerned, or even telepathy in general. We know there's something there. We keep nudging this post. We try to run up laws of averages and all sorts of things, trying to nail this thing down. So it's not an essential to this postulate, but it is something for you to keep your eyes open on. Now, in the whole field of preventive Dianetics, nothing is more shocking than watching the curves of accident rates in, let's say, one industry. They go up by two or three. Then they fail off and there won't be anything. You get the old... Uh, Railroad uh, superstition. Ah, there's been a wreck. There'll be two more. And there will be. It says so. It says so right there. I mean, that's the superstition which runs through the field, and a couple of guys will take it upon themselves to have the responsibility of getting these two other wrecks. These things all come in uh, groups. And uh, this is the reactivation of engrams, whether it is on an alarm reaction level or uh, whether it's on a mechanical re-stimulation level or anything else, it's still the same thing. It's a reaction of engrams, reactivation of them. So, if we want to cut out these group accidents and so on, let's uh, get in there and pick. For instance, a small change in the licensing of automobile drivers would do away with about 99% of the highway deaths and accidents. A very small change. It would merely be a selection out of those people who had had accidents. Just take it on an arbitrary level. This person has had an accident. He was driving. Somebody was injured in this accident to a point of having to be hospitalized. We could just say it like that. And we would just pull out of the whole run of drivers maybe 8, 9, 10 percent of them. After that, the highway death toll was because you would have selected out people who had accident prone engrams. I'm taking this arbitrarily on traffic department statistics. They have added this up and looked it over before, and they found out that 10% of the drivers cause over 90% of the accidents. So if they would just follow that up to that extent and just pull the licenses and make it 100 years in jail and we throw the key away on bread and water, if anybody drove a car who had had his ticket pulled, Highway accident tolls would go down. We are being actually as thoroughly brutalized and calloused on this subject of automotive accidents as were the Romans looking at the arena. We get in every year practically as many deaths or more than there were in our own army in World War I. Every year. And these aren't light accidents. They are destructive of lives, property, everything else. People go around and they say, well, we have to make the highways better. If you had people driving on those highways who weren't emotionally disturbed in the direction where they would be accident prone, you could probably hang them up on 45 degree angles and nobody would fall off of them. Or you could bank them, you could reverse bank, you'd do practically anything you wanted to those highways. That is not the factor. Of course, the ambitious young engineer who wants to see a great big highway budget, he wants to see the state legislature really put it out so the uncles and cousins and sisters and aunts can all be hired and a few other things. He wants to make a good name for himself and build big clover leaves because they look so pretty. Hangs on to the taxpayer these billions and billions and billions of dollars of highway improvement. And one of his chief arguments is we're going to prevent accidents. But do they? No, let's check over and find out how many accidents are now on this superhighway, and we find out there are more. Now, when we have 
this picture uh, clear in mind. We see what is making the accident, we see what's making accidents. And when, at one fell swoop, we could say the life of a person for every 15 minutes of, of every 24 hours. Now, is that worth saving? Uh, it's worth a big effort to save, isn't it? Yeah, because that's about what it is. We are, in essence, right here, a pressure group with a pressure weapon which goes off in a sort of an automatic level. I mean, we couldn't keep this thing from going off now. It'd be impossible. Because you see how far preventive Dianetics goes. You see how deeply it reaches into vital problems in the society. And it's all based mostly upon just that one thing, but there are intermediate steps which can be taken. That is to say, we have an aberrated world at this time. People are aberrated. We now have a means of determining what steps we should take in order to cause the minimal number of accidents in the society, the minimal number of deaths because of engram, the minimal number of sicknesses because of engram, and so on down the line, because it isn't only just accidents. What does professional auditor mean? Certified professional auditor. The, there is a certificate which I think you will all agree for the benefit of Dianetics has to be protected. Its status cannot be lord, a person receiving that certificate, which reads, greetings in that we place our trust and confidence in the skill and ability of we are hereby do that certificate is a professional auditing certificate. My God, anybody that will work Dianetics any place in the world, they can have it. Anything we know is theirs, as far as that's concerned. What we're trying to do, however, is to form up a very reliable group that people can count on. No, I mean auditing. So that cases won't fall up, so that these things won't happen. It's a pretty gruesome thing to be there on the couch and turn back down the track and have the auditor all of a sudden curl up in a small ball and fall on the clock. <laughs> it's happened many times. That's why people have to have a release why they do a heck of a lot of auditing. These people are perfectly welcome to treat people because they say they're in the rest of the track. Is then they'll get this busy and somebody audits them. Anybody who doesn't have an auditor standing by to co-audit with him until he's got a release is just playing with dynamite. And uh, when you give them a release, their honesty picks up. <laughs> they are a self-trapping mechanism. <laughs> so let them go ahead and advertise. There are people undoubtedly in the country today who are absolutely cleaning up with dynamite, and they will go right out of cleaning up until they have to be cleaned up. <laughs> but we better have to make a move, right? There isn't any reason why we should. After all, we're not trying to operate a big corporate monopoly. We just happen to know more about it than anybody else. We can turn out good auditors. We can keep the people together. We can set it up as an organization unit, and in that way, it will advance. It can advance as a single thrust rather than an accidental one. But don't think that if it were just dropped into society, just and overlooked by all of us, that it wouldn't advance. The techniques of Dianetics are in the handbook. Those techniques are workable. You would be fascinated to know how much Dianetics is taught just by contagion. That is to say, here you have instructed a small body of auditors. About 60% uh, of that instruction wasn't on the record. Now, you're studying the overall body, the knowledge of Dianetics. Yes, there's a handbook on it, but it's the overall body of the subject into which you're moving, even though if we never talked about anything but processing. You're getting data, data, data along the line on this stuff, which, if you want to check back, was not that way in the handbook quite. It wasn't presented exactly that way. I found out about what professional auditing did one day in Elizabeth, when the basic course, which had had, they came to class, and they sat in class for a couple of hours, and uh, they went home again about three times a week. And they'd been there, I think, for about three weeks at that time. And 
one of the boys of that group had been taking the professional auditing course. He'd also been in that group, so he was attending these meetings. Of course, everybody was attending the meetings. And I was reviewing some of the auditing that was being done by those people. This particular professional embryo, this gentleman, was very badly re-stimulated at that time. He didn't care whether this preclear lived or died. His own case was terribly fouled up. His auditing skill was, according to everyone in the professional group, easily the worst that we had. This chap sits down, he takes a preclear, and he just really goes through the motions. The sloppiest job of auditing you ever saw in your life. He goes through the motions, and he gets into the basic carry, and he knocks out an engram. And it's just uh, going off like this, and he's sitting there, and he's holding his stomach, and he isn't much paying attention. You hear a bouncer occasionally, he clips the bouncer a couple of times, and then hold his stomach again. And uh, this guy actually ran out and then grabbed and reduced it in the basic area, and that we had to come on up to the present time and crawl off someplace. <laughs> but it was a fantastically able job of auditing. The people just before him and just afterwards where they weren't badly restimulated, they were terribly interested in whether or not their pre-clear got cleared. And uh, they went in, and they patted caked around, and they monkeyed around, and they did this, and they did that, but they didn't do a job of auditing. Right away, I looked at this horrific thing that seems to happen to people in the process of a month of association close up to Dianetics with some personalized instruction. Wham! It works. For instance, I kept an eye cocked a little bit at some of the student auditors who were over there. When I first walked in here, I saw some examples of auditing that looked like they might have looked like tight rope walking or something, but they didn't look like auditing. And uh, I was just looking at some people there, just glanced a couple places, and uh, they were doing a competent job of auditing. Only two weeks ago. It's interesting what takes place with that. We got our, a line to hold and to advance. I want to talk to you now about a very interesting phase of preventive Dianetics, namely the pregnant woman. Now, the pregnant woman has always been an interesting problem in the society. But she becomes a fascinating problem for the professional auditor. Since he has to make a judgment of whether or not he practices preventive Dianetics or practices processing on it, he has to make that adjudication. There is a rule of thumb by which he goes. Because of her nervousness, her morning sickness, her debility, he may find it necessary to audit her, particularly in view of the fact that she may give the child a very bad birth, or the child might even die during birth because of a bad birth. Morning sickness, she doesn't want the child, she's liable to practice an AA on herself. She's got to think of these things. But, on the other side of it, if her morning sickness is relatively minimal, she isn't likely to practice an AA. If somehow or other she can suffer through without a great deal of injury to this child, he must realize that any engram he runs out of her, particularly a grief engram, may transplant. If you have ever seen a preclear roll up in a ball suddenly or leap convulsively on the couch, you will understand that the <coughs> inter-abdominal pressure is increased. When that pressure is increased, even mildly, we get a transmission. We particularly get a transmission in a grief engram. When mama cries, when mama can cries, particularly convulsively, sobs of grief, and so on, that grief charge will transplant, and it will have the very interesting data in it. Let's go over it again. Let's go over it again. Let's go back to the beginning. When I count from one to five, the phrase will flash into your mind. From up to present time. In other words, within a generation, or less than a generation, we're going to have to have a new pattern. At some stage here in the next 15 years, we will just change the pattern. And uh, that will take care of it. But at the same time, these are very uncomfortable commands to have in an engram. 
there is a return over the grounder. Now, that's not going to erase this engram. It means that uh, when a person gets to some part of the engram, he'll have a tendency to go over it again. No? A sort of a bouncer. Uh, all sorts of uh, oddities will show up because of dianetic pattern when they're enclosed in the engram. Here's some poor professional auditor 20 years from now running this child or running this young man. And he says, uh, all right, now let's return. By that time, if we don't have the one shot clear, which we may have, I hope, we can't count on that. So he will say, well, let's return now to the moment when the fellow will say, how? And he'll say, what's wrong? Turn now to the moment when you see? I, he'll have that in the end breath. Now he'll say, who died? And he will say, nobody, nobody died. We check through carefully, we find out, no, no relatives missing. They're all present. And yet there's a death here. Somebody's dead. Yeah, it was somebody in one of Mama's engrams. Maybe her great-grandfather, which puts it all out of reach over here, completely out of line. This is back there two or three generations. He couldn't possibly have known this great-grandfather. And yet he's got the engram about his death. Now you see how that would be? So therefore, if we run out many of these grief engrams in a woman who is pregnant, she will give birth to a child who will give every evidence of having had a great deal of sorrow in his life. He wasn't had any. So you see how this issue becomes clouded. It is a matter of adjudication. When people ask me bluntly, should you audit a pregnant woman? You can't answer that yes or no. It's qualifiably so. This woman may be, if her aberrations are causing her to do and be things which are injurious to the child to the point of costing it its life, yes, audit. If she can get by, Till after the child is born, leave it alone. Do a little bit of straight wire about the best you can do. Sometimes you can whip these cases up a little bit on straight wire without hitting grief discharges or anything without any disturbance. If you audit a woman who is pregnant, make very, very sure that she is not going to turn over and fall hard on her stomach or uh, beat herself in the stomach or uh, otherwise into that child. Now, I actually would say offhand that uh, she probably ought to have a piece of armor plate strapped around her. I believe that. One of these days in the society, women may be wearing a piece of armor plate when they're pregnant, an expanding piece of armor so the child can't be hurt. Nobody thought it was important before. It's important now. If it's something is important like that, well, very probably somebody will do something about it. It isn't up to us to say what should be done. Now, leave the girls alone. Yeah, that's right. It's a good piece of armor plate, but every time she put it on, the baby stopped moving. That baby was cramped. This is uh, of uh, great interest. These matters are brutal. You ever see pictures of people back in the Victorian period? I saw a skeleton of one that had been exhumed, and it was fascinating what had happened to that rib cage. The rib cage on this skeleton was right down to where you could uh, just put your hands around the bottom part of it. Yeah, hourglass. The hourglass figure. If people look back over the period of history, I imagine fashions of that type, so forth, have preceded very aberrated actions on the part of the society in the next generation. There are now a horrible thing sometimes takes place, and if you ever run across a young girl who is pregnant and unmarried, you know, like high school girl, and you've got to do something about it, for heaven's sakes, check up on this one. Is she wearing something, lacing herself in in such a way that it won't become obvious? If she is, that poor child has got a continuous engram for every moment that that child is laced in too tightly. Make sure these girls do this. A lot of women do this, check up on it in any case, but uh, particularly young girls. Now, on preventive Dianetics, very definitely along that line, cases of moral perpetuity should never be handled 
in the fashion which they are handled by the society. Never the system is entirely and completely and utterly wrong. No matter how wrong the act may seem, is there any reason to ruin the health of a girl and the sanity of a future child just to be moral? No, I'm afraid not. As uh, many doctors have gotten in trouble by saying, a good contraceptive is uh, more efficacious in these matters, and a knowledge of contraception is very, very efficacious, more than an ignorance of sex. You will find, as some of your most serious cases, people who have been born from a woman who conceived them out of wedlock. Now, preventive Dianetics definitely goes in to the field of morals. Morals came about to reform harmful practices. Everything that is now moral was at some time or other harmful to the race. That is the practical side of morals. But morals go forward in the society by contagion. They go forward in the society by contagion. That is to say, a moral code of all things is set up. For instance, right now, a code which was initially, evidently, I don't lay this down as a this, as a matter of fact, is an observation, a rather humorously grim one, that a lot of our present-day morals came into existence as venereal disease moved in on the society. Nobody could do anything about venereal disease, so they shifted the moral code so that it would take care of some portion of the venereal problem. Now we have penicillin and soft thiazole. Now all of a sudden the moral problem comes up against our wiping out venereal disease. Morals are practical considerations. They were always, in the initial stages of their creation, were a practical consideration on the part of some race or group. They are practical entities. They have practically nothing to do with spirit. I know a great deal about spirit, I hope, and if I've never been able to find morals aiding and abetting it. It's not that we want an immoral society, we want a rationally moral society. And rational morality at this time demands, for instance, in the matter of venereal disease, that it be brought into the open quickly as a disease and that it be treated, cared for, because it can be stamped out of all the societies of the world. But we've got the weapons to do it. That is where a moral going forward by contagion becomes in itself a social aberration. And actually, the main part of your social aberrations that are carrying forward now are old fragments of morals which we have even forgotten as a race. That it would be difficult to trace their inception. Those are social aberrations. First, they are practical considerations. They are used for very definite purposes. Then they come forward break up, their use is outmoded, but they're going forward as a set code and become then an aberration because now they're not rational anymore. And what's an aberration? It's an irrationality. Don't misinterpret me or quote me that I am against morals. I'm not. Morals are fine. However, morals are not understood by this society today and uh, we hope we'll make them a little better understood because it's a vital problem. You look up in the dictionary today and you find ethics. This really stands a philosopher's hair on him. You find ethics. What does it mean? It's moral sense. And you look up on your morals and what do you find? It's the ethics. Morals are ethics and ethics are moral, but they aren't that at all. Ethics have to do with a code of agreement amongst people that they will conduct themselves in a fashion which will attain to the optimum solution of their problems. That's ethics. Morals are things which were introduced into the society to resolve harmful practices which could not be explained or treated in a rational manner. So you had to create an artificial sort of a law which went forward, which would not be an optimum solution prophecy, which is block this and we'll block that in an effort to keep this from happening. 
In other words, as you might call them, the malls were jack leg solutions all the way along the line. We didn't have the answer, so we invented a preventive. Didn't know what caused it, couldn't stop it in any other way. Let's prevent it, let's invent a moral. Now uh, that's actually the history of moral codes. Anybody wants to examine that field closely, I know that this is a very simplified statement, but it's actually the fundamental with which I'm dealing. Now in this society today, if a moral code injured the life of an individual and did not enhance the life of any other individual, that morality is destructive and should be struck from the culture of the society. It's an unfortunate thing that several of those kicking around today have this result. Without aiding the society, they hinder. Of course, it gets into a very involved problem. Sometimes it gets into a financial problem. Some agency has been hired to enforce morals on the society. Boston Blue Laws. The Crime Squad of Pasadena. Pardon me, the Vice Squad. We're, we are, by the way, organized an organization for the suppression of vice squads. <laughs> now, uh, we found out, by the way, that this vice squad had a very definitely a vested interest in the morality of the community and to such an extent had waged blackmail and had picked up blackmail material and were waxing rich with blackmail. And this was the vice Morals are remunerative to some people. That's vested interest. But if vested interest hurts the society in any way, we don't have to go and push down walls. That vested interest will cave in it, it's existing for the injury of men. Men take care of this more or less themselves. All they have to do is look around and take a, an irrational measure of the problem and say, this thing is harmful. And all of a sudden, it'll change. It changes rather rapidly. So, in preventive dianetics, we get, whether we want it or not, the problem of morality. Now, morality is a very interesting, uh, very interesting thing. But when it takes a high school girl, sends her down to an abortionist, impedes her sexually, blocks the second dynamic, wrecks her glandular structure, gives her a sense of great guilt, gives her an engram, of a sort which kicking around and festering in any reactive mind will undoubtedly have triggered the majority of the rest of the engrams in the bank. And if we as a people say that this is necessary, we're nuts, but I guess we are. <laughs> You'll find sometimes run into the case of a girl who has been handled in this fashion. High school girl. She's gotten, quote, into trouble. All right? What do we do? She becomes then a juvenile delinquent. We put a label on her. She becomes a moral liability in the society. And her parents are liable to ship her off and have an abortion performed on Sometimes a judge on the bench will declare that an abortion be performed on But if somebody says, no, this child shall be born, remember something has happened here. Think of the thieves, the greed. The uh, yak-yak all over the shop, the emotional upset that surrounds this young girl. And we have a very, very nasty engram bank. You'll go back toward one of those engram banks in some pretty clear one time where this situation has happened, and you will wind up wishing to Christ somebody had shot that judge or hanged those parents or something would have happened because you just wade, wade, wade through this stuff. Secrecy, guilt, shame, grief. All of these things in the prenatal area of a person who was himself completely and utterly guiltless except that he had a biological reaction occur at the beginning of his lifespan. We have the adoption problem. You run into this in auditing of finding somebody who doesn't know he was adopted. And uh, immediately if this happens, we don't find the same dramatizations in his parents that we found in his prenatal bank. Now, if a child is without his parents, one of two things have happened. The parents have been killed sometime after birth, too early for the person to remember, or there is a, what they call probably, possibly, moral turpitude or poverty. There's something wrong 
in that person's life, but he has to be adopted after birth. And so we have these people around who adopt children. There is an adoption market that goes on. $1,000 paid in, get to adopt a child, and so on. All this is very interesting, but what are they buying? They're buying a rough prenatal bank. If you look over the history of adopted children, you'll find out that it is not as good as it should be. But the child has been done in enormously good favor. The dramatizations which are in the prenatal bank aren't duplicated in the postnatal bank. Furthermore, the words are not re-stimulated. The prenatal bank of this person is not re-stimulated. The dramatizations don't occur. But occasionally, the person is old enough or has had enough keyed in at the time of his adoption to make his case pretty rough. This is where we call for child Dianetics in a hurry. In other words, the sins of the little high school girl, which were so horribly condemned, fell upon the head of an innocent child and then became inflicted upon well-meaning foster parents who had nothing to do with it at all. This is the way contagion runs through the society. It's a very crooked course, a very crooked path. Uh, I'm showing you that preventive Dianetics goes into the moral structure of the society. It also goes into the ethical structure in all of man's activities. One could not draw the line and say, don't adopt children. This is silly, because people want children, they go on adopting them. But for heaven's sakes, when looking them over, look over the record of Mama. Under what circumstances was this child conceived? Were her parents very stern parents? Was she ever driven into the snow with a precious bundle in her hands or arms or under her belt? These are considerations. Very definite considerations. Now, in, uh, we go from there into the field of marriage in preventive Dianetics. We want to prevent all these divorces that are happening in the society. Actually, we can prevent them. People only too often choose their reactive mind partners. That is to say, Gertrude marries actually Uncle Bill. Only Uncle Bill's name happens to be George. And the only similarity with, with Uncle Bill is uh, maybe the way he wears his hat and maybe his tone of voice. But Uncle Bill was the staunch champion of Gertrude all through her early youth. So she, of course, marries Uncle Bill, only his name's George now which is very confusing. And then she finds out that this Uncle Bill, because, of course, immediately, re-stimulation makes her take on the valence of whatever valence she was occupying as a little girl, and she does the things which pleased Uncle Bill. Please don't please George. <laughs> Up to this moment, she was a strong, reliant woman. But now she's a weak little thing that has to be defended. Or some such thing happens. And people marry... Before the marriage, there's somebody else. And when they marry, now there's somebody else again. This becomes very confusing. She expects certain things from Uncle Bill. Well, Uncle Bill took care of her a lot, took her swimming, was very nice to her. And one time when she was sick, why, he brought her all her meals in bed. Well, she'll start to use this in bed trick on George. And George doesn't understand anything about Uncle Bill. And the next thing you know, he gets uh, very resentful about a wife who insists on lying in bed having breakfast served in bed by him every morning. He had a different idea. His ally was for the name of Agnes, and he thinks that Gertrude is Agnes. <laughs> so, between Gertrude thinking George is Uncle Bill and George thinking Gertrude is Agnes, we get a confusion so that we find these people aren't married to each other at all, but a couple of allies, that'll be a lousy picture. Uh, we get the picture of two people who aren't there at all being married to each other, only they're both probably dead. You can see that this confusion will result in an occasional divorce. Well, in all of the annals of history, I don't think there have been as many divorces 
But divorces will continue to happen in any aberrated society. You ever hear of the practice of sub tea? Well, that was somebody pre practicing prevention. That's right. Prevention is a very simple measure over there with sub tea. They said no divorce. Nobody is going to get any divorce in this land anymore. Wives cannot divorce their husbands. So the wives murdered their husbands. <laughs> That's right. And then the next thing we got, wives murdered their husbands, and so somebody passed a law in order to make all this moral, you see? They passed a law and said, any wife who is really a wife at all will walk upon the burning fire and sizzle. <laughs> that's safety. Now that's prevention, acting against prevention. Arbitraries have been set up. The laws are arbitrary. Arbitraries have been introduced into society. Now we have to introduce the more arbitraries in order to make the first, first arbitraries work. And it keeps getting more and more irrational, less and less sensible until we have a complete cave-in of an institution, let's say, of marriage. So, reactive mind partners as a problem is a very, very sad one. I could go up to Reno and pick up any ten divorcees. I would find ten reactive mind partners married to ten people who had married reactive mind partners. Only lives get wrecked in that sort of a way. And it's no joke, you know, that a broken home causes, a broken home causes a child to have an upset life. You see, it isn't the breaking of the home. It's the yak yak. And then it's the loss of the ally. One or the other of them may have been an ally. That person goes away, loss of an ally. Quarrels. If a home is going to break up, people are going to be divorced. There's probably been quarrels and bitterness between them before that time. So we've got a bad prenatal bank, bad postnatal bank, then we have a broken home. Of course, the broken home's obvious. We can look at the broken home and say, well, children go a little bit aberrated because they have, some of them, when they have broken homes, they become aberrated, you know. That isn't the reason. It's because of reactive mind partners. If you really want to be sure, you want to know how to pick out your spouse? While you look them over and you make awfully sure, you find out, let's say it's a man picking a woman, Find out if she likes Papa. Then the matter of reactive mind uh, partners, one should prevent those things. The woman picking a man would find out whether or not he loved his mother dearly. You know, dearly. Boy, leave him alone. Uh, if there's a, a really terrific, strong attachment with Mama, if he does what Mama says and so forth, Boy, his valences are so slopped up and turned around and so on. He's a liability. Now, if uh, he hates his mother viciously, leave him alone. If he hates his father, that isn't so bad. But if he is passionately fond of Papa, that's not so good. Look over the parents. Look over the parents and try to find out by looking over the parents. This is the basic law on it. Let me actually even call it a little axiom that'll help. Look over the parents and find out how aberrated they are. That is, are they very stern, good people? You know? That horrible. <laughs> are they extremely. What did they do? Did they change this person's mind all the time uh, about everything? There was a great deal of trouble there with allies. They fight with grandma over this child and so on. But look at these people as people and realize that in the human being is potentially the balance of each one of these people and probably the majority of the engrams of these people. You can therefore look over a girl's parents or a man's parents and uh, don't take just the social look. Try to take a pioneer look if you can. You, you know about what the setup is. That's dirty trick. So once you're in on this. But you as auditors should have no trouble whatsoever. Just check this character over. Let's not check it off. But if you're passing out advice to the loved one any time, well, that's about the rule you go by. Uh, the woman is more likely, or a woman might be in either parent's valence, but the chances of being either in the valence of one or the other, even if she detests them, the chance is very good that she will be in one valence or the other rather than her own. 
and uh, same way with a man. But out here in the divorce marks, if you want to slow it down quickly, why, uh, just put in a little propaganda to that effect, I could see the marriage rate falling off. Yeah, yeah very definitely. Until something is done about it. The divorce rate probably go up. Actually, it's a, it's a terrible thing for two reactive mind partners. They re-stimulate each other enormously. Uh, they, the society commands that they stay together, two people that should never be in sight of each other. They keep re-stimulating each other, and their health and efficiencies and so forth just go down in a dwindling spiral. They're being absolutely ruined as people. At the same time, they may have a terrific compulsion to stay together. The engrams say, I love you, I just don't uh, leave you, I can't leave. Yakety, 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 yakety. <laughs> and this guy that she just loved to put arsenic in the coffee for, she has to sit there every morning because it says, I love him, I've got to love him, I've just got to love him. Well, the science of thought would not particularly guarantee to resolve an old mores of the society. Maybe the mores isn't right, I don't know. If you say, well, dynetically we can resolve marriage, so marriages will be happy, we're taking what is apparently a constrained, maybe just a maybe tiny bit artificial institution of society. There's no reason why it would be really a natural institution. And we're applying a natural law to it, and I can tell you what happens when you apply the natural law to it. About 50% of the marriages blow up in your face. And about 50% of them cement very strongly and go along beautifully. Because in the process of treating one or the other, you're liable to have two people who are naturally antipathetic. And you'll, you'll clear them up, you'll release them up to a point where one of them will suddenly decide, oh well, I don't have to stay with this guy and she'll leave. <laughs> Some of the day somebody is going to throw a terrible a harpoon into Dianetics by saying it breaks up marriages. It doesn't break up marriages. I've seen it pull together marriages which were really on the rocks. And I've also seen it blow marriages apart. But the whole trick is getting it past the hump up to a point where they would be perfectly rational with each other. You get it halfway up the hump, one of them is liable to get enough force or strength and so forth to just separate right there. It would be an interesting thing uh, an attorney who was a good auditor, a uh, good divorce attorney, would probably raise hell with his fees, but he could probably sit right there and with straight wire salvage about 50% of the marriages which come to him to be put on the rocks. He could actually do so. He's sitting in the driver's seat on the thing. These people come to him for advice and so forth, and they all want to hear all about the legal problem, what are the alimony laws and community property laws and something or other and so on. He says, how old are you? <laughs> It would fall quite a bit. <laughs> well, now, this is all, this is all of these things I'm just giving to you as window dressing on preventing Dianetics, giving you some sort of an idea of the scope of preventing aberration. Preventing Dianetics as a basic subject, of course, doesn't much deal with these superficial things like we're talking about marriage, other superficialities. Uh, Preventing Dianetics has, right there is basis, preventing the engram from occurring in the first place, and then if that can't be done, preventing the re-stimulation of the engram. And if these things can happen, why aberration of society is flattened quite markedly. Does a phonograph record care whether you're playing Beethoven or traffic horns? They're just records. They're unanalyzed. As a result, you would get no rationality on it. However, after birth, a child which moves in on a stage is born, maybe has a bad prenatal bank, but uh, is born and goes on with life, and the parents are nice to the child, and uh, they do definitely mend their ways rapidly toward this child, you get a, a pretty sane kid. Uh, actually, the human organism is terribly, terribly hard to aberrate. Very difficult to aberrate. It takes a lot of magnitude.